Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Shea Station podcast. We're on episode 27, and we have a very special episode for you guys today. If you follow us on our socials, you know that today is our first voicemail mailbag episode. We got a bunch of great questions from you guys. Uh, I'm one of your co-hosts, Jolly Olive, a.k.a. Jack. I'm here with Jerry Seinfeld, uh, the main star of many seasons of Seinfeld back in the 1990s. It's an honor to have you, Jerry. How you doing today, man? What's the deal with voicemail? Mm. I don't know. How was that, Seinfeld? How was that? Was that bad? I feel I feel like we need to edit it that right out. No, I feel like I just you channeled him. I feel like I was standing before him. That was crazy. I yeah, that's good. Uh, I'm great, man. I'm excited for this. It, it's proof that we actually have people that listen to the show, which is you know reassuring that we're not just. Although I do t- love talking to you, that we're not just <laughs> back and forth. You know, just throwing it out there and, and nobody's catching it and, and listening. So that's good to know. It's not just thousands of bots. I'm excited for the questions. All all the questions I've been getting from my friends and, and family and, and people I run into is like, what's going on with the lockout? I can't wait to hear, you know, I, I'm imagining most of them are Met specific, but uh, I, I'm excited. I'm excited to, to get into it. It's good to be back on air. Yeah, as far as I know, nothing lockout related, which is good. And uh, yeah, I mean, just shout outs to you guys because we got a decent bit of calls for our first voicemail episode attempt. So we really appreciate that. If you guys missed it and didn't see it on our socials, make sure you go follow us on all platforms because we'll be posting the next time we plan to do one. This one was a, a pretty big success, so there'll probably be more in the future. We have seven questions laid out for you guys today. We're going to go one by one. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else before we jump right into it. I don't, I don't think I promoted that very well because I don't remember, uh, I'll force my, my, my friends on Twitter to, to send me voicemails next time. We'll get more. We gotta, we gotta fire your, your social media team. I'll disguise my voice. I'll be like, Hey guys, uh, I got a good question. Why is Jerry so ruggedly handsome? Wow, that's a, it's a little conceited, just like a little bit. Well, it's only it's a question. Yeah, it's not wasn't it wasn't me. It was somebody else. Your impressions are like spot on today. You have Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> you got the random caller. I'm two cups of coffee deep already. I think that's why the energy is there. All right. Well, I guess I'm going to play voicemail number one. I think we'll just jump right in. All right. This is our first one. And it comes from Ned. Hey, Jolly and Jerry. This is Ned, a uh, huge fan of the podcast. My question to you guys is, who is the biggest low-risk, high-reward signing the Mets could go after? Thank you. First of all, Ned. You don't hear many Neds out there. Ned know, is a right? name like Jerry. It's like only only a few and far between people are named Ned or Jerry these days. I think Ned is like an underrated name, you know? Like, I feel like it, it, Classic. it, it gets classed in maybe some of the, like, the nerdy names, like Sheldon or something like that. But Ned is like... Ned seems like a reliable guy. Well, that's a Simpsons thing. Yeah, true. You know, it's a Simpsons thing. Uh, and he's left-handed. So I love you, Ned. You're you're my guy. Do you think Ned the Caller is left-handed too or no? I won't hold it against him if he's not, but I'd like to dream. Okay. I like that. Cool. So <laughs> left-handed Ned, this is for you, my friend. Uh, my, my, I just, I, I want starter depth. So I'll start there. And I think, I think Zach Grinke's out there for the taking on a mm. short, really short, maybe a one-year deal. He's coming off like a, a season where he had some injuries. He had like a neck issue at the end of the year where he wasn't built up. He had like a five in the second half, a five and a half. But I think he just knows how to pitch. And if we can keep him healthy, because we we have enough young guys that when he needs a break, we can bring a guy in and, and have him fill it out. Or, you know, Trevor Williams, we have, a guy, we have guys that can log enough innings. But if you can get 20... 25 really high quality starts from him. Uh, I think that's a good way to go. I like, I like the veteran presence that he brings, you know, on a team planning to, to make a run at the world series. He's got experience doing it all. And uh, I think having him, a guy like that, I imagine DeGrom could learn a ton of stuff from him too. Uh, so that trio of, of Scherzer, uh, DeGrom, and then a, an aging uh, Zach Grinke would just be a fun combo. Yeah, I, I really like that because I feel like the the one like veteran 
uh, high AAV, low years deal that we always keep hearing about is Clayton Kershaw. And like Clayton Kershaw has a ton of suitors and he's coming off a bit of injury last year, like some of the other veterans on the market that, and you almost forget that Zach Greinke is kind of there for the tanking. He's coming off like one of his lesser seasons in recent time. But like you said, the guy's pitched in the world series like several times now. And he's, you know, the Astros have been to five straight ALCSs. So if you're in that market for like playoff experience, Zach Greinke is one of those guys. And imagine the rotation of DeGrom, Scherzer, and Greinke back in like 2017 or something. That's like the dream right there, you know? It's all coming together. Uh, For mine, I'm also going to do pitching, but I'm going to focus more on the bullpen because I feel like there's a lot of like relievers that are still out there for the taking that are kind of getting a little slept on a little bit. The one I picked out was Colin McHugh because one former Met, so you know, you got to bring him back eventually. I forgot he was a Met. Yeah, like way before. I forgot that. He was he was the guy we traded to get Eric Young Jr. with the Colorado Rockies. EY. Gotcha. Big EY guy. Me too. And I like his, his pops. Great guy. His pops yeah. was a little bit more famous, but I like EY. Um, Colin McHugh, I like him just because he's one of these low velo guys with like tons of secondary pitches. He's got like six pitches in his arsenal and the Rays really got the most out of him. And now he knows his worth. I think he's got tons of suitors around the league. But again, this isn't going to be an expensive deal because it is for a reliever who's not been a closer in recent time. So if you really want to shore up the back end of that bullpen with guys like Edwin Diaz and Seth Lugo and Trevor May, I think Colin McHugh is like a perfect foil to those guys. You have tons of like tall beasts in the bullpen that can fire it in at like 100 miles per hour. And I think Colin McHugh is like a really good palate cleanser to those guys just because he brings something completely different to the table. So I think Colin McHugh's my pick. I also kind of like Danny Duffy a little bit. Danny Duffy had a really good first half with the Royals last year, got traded to uh, the Dodgers when he was injured, and he just actually never ended up taking the mound. So the Royals kind of won that deal, I guess. I think he'll probably return to Kansas City just because he's been there forever. But if you're looking for, like, you know, a back-end starter on a low-cost deal, you know, you have that risk there with the injury. But I think Danny Duffy, you can get a lot of value out of him too. I, I I want to disagree with you on Duffy. I think mm. it's a lot higher risk because of the injury history. And I think it'll be a little bit more expensive um, okay. because he's a starter and starters just get paid more. Um, I don't mind Colin McHugh because I think he's coming into his own as a reliever, like you said. I think he's really found his kind of area of comfort where he can maximize the things that he does. And I made my whole career basically off of being a palate cleanser. I loved throwing after DeGrom and, and Strasburg. Those are my favorite times because I, my, I threw my curveball even more knowing that it looks like a Bugs Money changeup because after you're, you're so locked in trying to hit 100, then you come in and you see 73, you know, all of a sudden you're swinging three, four times at it. So I, I like that idea. I didn't think about Colin McHugh. I, I really like the fit. Plus, he was a Met. Come back. Come on home, kid. Queens loves you. Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, that's something we don't really, like, think about a whole ton. Like, that's something that never really popped in my mind of how different the arsenals can be between pitchers and how that can easily throw a hitter off if they have a game plan going the entire way. And, you know, the Rays You talked about the – yeah, you talked about the Rays. I remember that when they were in the World Series the first time they had – when Loop was still there, they had that, like – um the clock show up and then mm. they had all their arm slots that went all the way around yeah. on the, both the right and left side. Super cool. Uh, but it does mean something when you're coming at a different angle with different pitches at different speeds, it really, it really throws the hitter off because it's a completely different setup. So I like, I like McHugh. Let's go get him. I like that question. So thank you very much, Ned, for being our first ever voicemail question. <laughs> well, round of yeah, thank you, Ned. Guy. Left-handed Ned. And uh, thank your parents for naming you Ned. Cause I, I like it. Hell yeah. Give him a Very call. manly. All right. Shall we move on? Please. All right. This one's a Jerry specific question. So lucky you. Oh, pressure's on. Yeah. Hey, Jolly. Hey, Jerry. Uh, long time listener, first time caller. Hope you guys are doing well. I uh, so just want to say I love the show. You guys have made this lockout uh, much more bearable. So very much appreciate that. I've uh, got a question for Jerry. I heard on a recent episode that you had spent some time in Boise in the minors. And I just wanted to know what you thought of our fair city up here, up in Idaho. Um, how was it playing for the Hawks? And did you have any favorite spot in town to just sort of hang out? All right, I'll hang up and listen. Thanks, guys. Let's go, Mets. That's awesome. Who was that from? What was it? We didn't get a name, sadly, so I'm just going to call him Boise oh. guy, I guess. Boy, uh, a shout out to, what is it, like Sleepless in Seattle? We'll call him Ballin' in Boise. Should we give him, like, a custom name? Like, all right, so we got left-handed Ned. I'll call him Idaho. Okay, let's call him Idaho. I like I that. like it. It's like a code name. But for, yeah, so... I got signed. I signed right out of college um, 
almost immediately, I was like, let's, where am I going? And they sent me right to Boise, man, right out of college, 20 years old. So I didn't really have like a hangout spot. Plus we had, um, we had host families. And so all of us were living with, you know, parents basically, you know, like, so that was fun. But my favorite part was hanging out at the field. We were so good. We won the championship that year. Um, awesome time. I loved Boise. I loved going there. It was my first time ever being, you know, West of St. Louis. I got to see a completely different side of our country. Um, the people were wonderful, welcoming. Uh, it was an awesome time. The bus rides were tremendously long in the Northwest league. I mean, 15 hours to Vancouver, Jeez. you know, and then crossing a border on top of it. It was wonderful though. That was like the, the grit of it, but Boise is a beautiful city. Um, super clean, super fun. Uh, I, I, that was the first time that I met uh, a fan base. So I'm from Ohio. Everyone loves the Buckeyes. Of course. I've never met a fan base until I went to Boise where they like the Broncos, Boise State Broncos, more than the Ohio likes Ohio State. Damn. It's a tremendous fan base. They love their sports. That's a bold claim. <laughs> I agree. And uh, I, I enjoyed it. The whole Northwest, uh, it was awesome. I had a wonderful experience there. Uh, it was a perfect welcome to um, to pro ball for me. And then we ended up winning the championship, which was super cool. Yeah, I was going to ask about the uh, the team, actually, because I'm, I'm pretty unfamiliar with them, if I'm being completely honest. Were there any guys on that team that you remember or any guys that like made the show with you long term? I remember a bunch of guys. Um, so that year, there was a, a, another big leaguer. His name was Louis Montanez. Do you remember Louis Montanez? You stumped me, man. He, he came out. He ended up in the big leagues with Baltimore. Um, but he was this Miami grad or Miami high school guy that was anointed the next a rod coming out was a shortstop so when i signed he had he had changed i think he got the yips of some sort throwing from the infield and so he moved himself to the outfield and he was learning i had never seen a guy be able to barrel everything he never missed a barrel it was unbelievable um i was like this guy's the best hitter i've ever seen uh but that was him I, i played with a guy named ryan harvey um who's still doing like um big softball like he's a like the, the big league softball, you see him at the stadiums hitting balls out of the stadium. Um, I think that might be the only big leaguers. That was a fun, that was a fun time. Super fun team. Uh, I was with the Cubs at the time. And then they, I think they switched at some point, but I loved it there. Were you weren't starting games back then, were you? No, no. So that was, that was uh, I got, I showed up to the team and, and the pitching coach and manager are like, Hey, welcome. You know, we don't know anything about you. And he looked at me, he goes, what? He goes, are you starter reliever? And then he goes, wait. And he looked at me. He was like, you're a reliever. I was like, <laughs> why? He goes, well, you're, you're, your frame. You're not going to be able to handle 200 innings. So that was the first time I got moved to the bullpen uh, in my whole life, like consistently. And so, you know, I'm happy. It, I'm happy. It, they made the transition. I, I really loved doing it so yes it boys it kind of set you on your career path too that's kind of cool they did they did i learned it's great you know jim diedrich uh was my pitching coach he didn't last long in in the organization but um i learned a lot from him really quick tom byers my manager it was super fun i loved it uh fond memories i love that i've been back a couple of times that's awesome man a hey, great question from our guy idaho next time if you call again make sure to give us your name so we can thank you properly man love it all right Let's see what we got next. We do have some more Jerry specific questions, but I think this one's for both of us. Let's see. Oh, this is probably my favorite call of of all of them. Hey guys, I'm Max from Germany and I just got into watching baseball about a year ago by randomly seeing a highlight reel of Bartolo's time with the Mets and yeah, became a Mets fan. So I really, really enjoy your show and wanted to thank you for the great content you put out every week and wanted to ask you what's the funniest or strangest thing you guys have experienced in a baseball stadium bye well that's awesome because i didn't know that we had listeners in germany so shout out max for calling all the way from like a different continent that's <laughs> oh my insane. goodness that's awesome thanks max that's great man uh welcome to the mets fandom um you came at a good time and uh seeing bartolo highlights i mean that'll get you that'll get most people it's a great way to get anointed you know i uh, i agree man that's cool 
Um, wonderful, beautiful accent. I'm so jealous. You can't fake something like that. That was authentic. Yeah, that's lovely. Uh, I'm, I mean, there's people out there that can fake a German accent. I mean, I know you can because you have like proficiency with all these. Sprechen you know, Sie Deutsch. It's a, it was right there, right? That was good. That was Jerry from Germany. That was, uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Mine's easy just because this was the first baseball game that I remember attending like consciously. Um, and it was 2009 Mets. Um, I'm sure many listeners are familiar with it just because of how ludicrous this game was from top to bottom, excluding the play that I'm going to talk about. Um, this was a Mets versus Phillies game, and uh, one of my all-time favorite Mets, uh, Jeff Frank Kaur, was the uh, unfortunate recipient uh, of a game-ending unassisted triple play when he lined out to Eric Bruntlett with runners on first and second who ran on the pitch. And I remember seeing it, and I was young and I was still learning the game, so I didn't fully understand what happened, but I remember people getting up to leave and I was go I, I was going why are they leaving because the ninth inning had just started we had first and second nobody out and the play had happened in like five seconds and then all of a sudden the game was just over and my I had to have my dad basically explain to me what an unassisted triple play was <laughs> and I, I could I remember not being able to believe it and just sort of like laughing when I left just because it was such a crazy game from top to bottom and having it end with something that hadn't happened in 70 years you could get mad at it, sure, but I was still a young Mets fan, so I didn't understand the full amount of pain from the early 2000s. So I was sort of just like giggling at the whole thing. That my answer was tied with that, and then also the the weird whistle debacle that was going on in the uh, Lindor three home run game because we were there. Uh, I was there with uh, Jim and Jake and BBD. And when you're watching on TV, you can obviously get some clarification into what the on-field scuffle is about. But when you're there and it's loud and everyone's yelling, um, all you see is people just pouring out onto the field and arguing over what you don't really understand. So <laughs> it was kind of cool because it was just like you're caught up in the madness of it all. And you're like, people are fighting and you just like are into it because they are. And like, you know, the Mets and Yankees haven't had that bad blood in years. And I've really found it funny just because I didn't understand why people were mad at each other. And the Mets ended up getting the win anyway. So I think it's a tie between those two. Those are good ones. Like that's a, that's not, I don't know if it's the the funniest thing, but that moment you had in the stands with your dad and like learning the game. That's what I love about baseball. There's so many things that happen. It's, it takes like a, like an appreciation for like, you, you don't, you don't see it on the, like a uh, basketball is a great sport. I love it, but it's very simple. You're watching it. You see what's happened. The ball goes in the hoop points go in. Oh, he shot it from this far away. That's worth an extra point. That kind of stuff. You don't see little weird things um, like a triple play. Like it's crazy. Um, so that's awesome. That's a tough question for me personally. Um, there's one thing that jumps out in my mind kind of right away. And I think I remember the game, but I'll tell you the scenario. So I was with Oakland. We had our shortstop Cliff Pennington um i think it was the 2012 playoffs game four walk-off but i'm not exactly sure so I'll, I'll go back and try to bring up a clip but we had a walk-off hit i think it was coco we're celebrating we're all running after you know he just rounded first base after the the run scores and we're all like dog piling on and then you just see like in the clip Pennington just fly off the side because he got barreled into and he jumps like 15 feet and he gets rolled over and I remember jumping in the pile and Pennington's like tears are falling because he's laughing at himself so hard. And he just goes, I can't wait to see that replay. And you see it. And we brought it up in the clubhouse after we're celebrating. And all of a sudden, like you see Penny and then all of a sudden he just gets launched, you know, like 15 feet by. So those are the moments that I remember the most. That's the one that sticks out. Uh, there's a million of them. I could I could do a whole episode on these. But uh, Max, thank you for the question. I, I'll try to to find that clip, or I'll let Jolly, our our content creator, do that. I'll I'll do some hunting. And like I, I've always like <laughs> like walk off celebrations. They're always fun. But like you know, there have been some like pretty violent ones. Like the Kendrick. I don't know if you remember Kendrick Morales. Like broke up his leg real bad when he hit a walk off home run, and he like jumped on home plate. Yeah, that was a freak thing, though. He just landed on it. No, but yeah, that's every time that it happens, you see people move out of the way now yeah. and they don't really do it anymore. But it's it's like I'm, I've been playing with Johnny Gomes. Um, do you remember him? Oh, of course. I he, do. He'll punch you. Oh, yeah. He'll punch you while you're in there. You get punched in the in the ribs, all that stuff. Those guys <laughs> don't mess around. They say if you can't handle it, can't handle the celebration, don't do cool things. Stay so. out the pile, man. 
You're not meant to be there. <laughs> Stay out of the pile. I personally, I like Brett Phillips' way because Brett Phillips uh, in the World Series just kind of did the airplane, sort of ran away from everybody. He had the right idea, I think, because he was going to get mauled. It's a World Series walk-off. Come on. I mean, I, I could just watch him laugh for forever. I'd love to see him in a Mets uniform. We don't really need him, but like, I'd just like to see him anyway, just because he brings <laughs> something that's, you know, <laughs> he's just that kind of guy. His laugh. Have you ever seen that clip of him in spring training? Oh, yeah. And he did a Chris Rose rotation, and, like, he's just hilarious every time I see him. Yeah, Yeah, he was a – anyway. Well, thank you, Max, from Germany. Yeah. Um, Seriously. Let us know. Let us know if you ever come to the States for a game. That'd be awesome. That would be awesome. I'm glad you chose the Mets, man. And also, like, I think it's so cool that we have listeners outside of the U.S. and, like, Canada. That's so, like, bizarre to me, but, like, I'm thankful. I guess the strangest thing I've ever seen would have to be Bartolo's home run if we bring it full oh, circle. Because I, I mean, what are yeah. the what are the odds? It's like a historical thing after forty, like wonderful James Shields. I just know his reaction after he gave that up. It's a beautiful thing. If you watched Bartolo highlights, it, you know it's that, and then it's probably him working out with the bands. <laughs> Those are those are the best highlights. Were you in the dugout for? I, I forget if it was twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen. So were you injured or no? Like during the Bartolo in 15? home run. Yeah. Oh, no, I was in the bullpen in San Diego. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Because I wanted to know, because I'm whenever I watch that clip, the only thing that I find weird about it is that uh, the guys in the dugout, like, cleared out. So when Bart got back there, there was just not, and I don't get why they do that. I really, I, I agree. I don't That's understand my least. it. Everybody tried to give him the silent treatment. I thought it was a horrible idea. He loved it. Yeah, he, he was okay. But they come and then they jump on him. But I, it would have been, they, just dogpile that yeah, human being. Come on. Just get on top of that. Punch him in the ribs if you can get to him. Like it's all for it. <laughs> and like you know, that's why I like like you know college and like high school baseball like those serious playoff games because whenever a big hit is hit, those guys are out of the dugout and they're like ready to swarm you at home plate. They don't care about like the college rules baseball like is on a whole new level. The the rain delay celebration, like the 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 dance battles, all that stuff. It's a whole different level. Minor league baseball can be like that too, which is fantastic. Bart deserved better, but I'm glad he hit the home run anyway. All right, guys, we're going to take a brief break here to once again tell you about the John Boy Media merch store. Jerry, I, I didn't give you a fair warning. I know you, you don't have any JM stuff on today, but I know you got plenty in your wardrobe because I've seen it all. But if you guys are in the market for some merch, you know, we got some nice discount codes going. I'm once again going to plug our mug because I think it's the best mug at the store. I mean, I'm not biased, but I like I'm a little biased. We also got, you know, the nice Jolly Olive shirt. We just restocked these. I don't know if you're, are you a green guy? Is green in your wardrobe at all? I haven't seen you wear green before. It's, it's a, it's on heavy rotation. Usually in like pants. I wore green, like that khaki green color pants. I like that. So that's a personal choice. I mean, we got hoodies. We got uh, all these different uh, themed t-shirts, the sweaters, the tie-dye hoodies are big right now. I think we just sold out of another color. So if you're looking for something after the holiday season where, you know, prices are a little down, the demand isn't so high. I think now's the time to go to the John Boy Media merch store and take your pick. And as you guys know, if you're a regular listener, we have a discount code of our own. It's code SHEA, S-H-E-A. I trust you guys to spell it after we taught you guys last time on the last episode. That code's for 10% off your entire order. So go to shop.johnboymedia.com. Go see if there's anything you like. They got Jake Sucks sweaters, if you think Jake Sucks, which I think most people do. I think that's my favorite. That's my favorite company motto is Jake sucks. It's on the front page of everything. They really committed to it. I kind of feel bad for Jake. I wonder what he thinks of it. I haven't really asked him. I do not feel bad for Jake. He loves it. So yeah, code Shea for 10% off everything on your order at shop.jumboymedia.com. All right. We have four more questions to get to. We got a loaded call list here. So I think I'm going to fire up the next one. Uh, And this one is a Jerry specific one as well. Hey, uh, hey, fellas, this is uh, Jack over at Emily Nerds on both Instagram and Twitter. It's everyone's favorite uh, account, um, of course, as you guys can all see in the replies. Uh, anyways, this one's for Jerry, and I'm sure you talked about it before, but um, what was it like to start that one game? Because I do remember I was there, and I was very surprised to see you starting. Um, but what was your preparation like? What was it, what was it different? And, um, you know, when did you find out you're going to be starting that game? That's all. Uh, I hope you guys get to this question. If not, thanks for doing this. Really appreciate it. I'm unfamiliar with what game he's talking about, actually, believe it or not. Which, what, what team did this come from? You don't know? Gosh, I don't even want to talk about it. Why not? You want to, you, 
I think it was a record breaker. So it was like uh, 2018, which is a season that maybe the oh, worst season I've ever been a part yeah. of. We don't talk like, about 2018. Uh, just a collective, just a complete debacle head to toe. Um, but specifically, I think it was like late June, I made a start against the Dodgers. Uh, it didn't go well for me. It didn't <laughs> start out well. So I gave up back-to-back home runs to start the game. My no. only start in my whole career. It was uh, Kike Hernandez and then Max Muncy got me. Kike crushed it. Oh, that's a tough one, too. I mean, Kike, Kike was a mistake. Muncy hit a fastball away to left field. And I think if Dom was at the wall and put his hand up in the air, he could have caught it. But he kind of did this weird hop back into the wall and it like caught it. It was a weird, <laughs> he was, you know, he looked very much the, the, the first baseman. He's not a there. left fielder. I get it. <laughs> but it, but after that, I was, I was like, dude, if this is how it goes, I laughed. I was like, this is ridiculous. Um, and then I kind of really did well. I think I struck out like three or four batters. So I went two innings. Um, but to answer, but to answer Jack's question a little more closely, um, I found out at like nine that morning that I was starting. And so I actually went in that day sore and I was going to ask for the day off because I had pitched, like, I think I had the night before off and then I had pitched like the two previous days. And, but the night before, I think I warmed up like three or four times. So I was sore and I was like, man, I need, you know, I need, I need a day. And I was going in anticipating to see how my arm felt after catch if I could, you know, possibly take the day off, whatever the case may be. And they go, Hey, how do you feel about starting today? You know, so-and-so is not feeling good. And I'm like, hell with it. Let's do it. And I was like, all right. So I found out then I was like, you know, I'll, I'll probably never get the chance to start um, again. And I did it. So I was right about that, but uh, it was completely different. So, you know, what's normally a relaxed morning, I just kept, I kept, I keep remembering, like looking at the clock, thinking like, when should I go out there? Um, what do I do? And what, what should I, what sh- do I have to stretch? And so it was like a debacle for me personally, because normally I just get, hear the phone. I'm, I know my routine. And so my whole routine was off. And so I wasn't comfortable from the jump. I got ready way too early because it took me five pitches in the bullpen. What normally takes starters like 50. And so I was just sitting in the dugout, like, you know, too long. And and then, you know, it it wasn't a great experience, but I'm glad I got to do it. Uh, I ended up like pitching. Okay. I gave up two hits and it was just the first two home runs. Yeah. Um, I mean, you strike out Puig, you strike out Logan Forsyth and you got Austin Barnes looking. So, I mean, after the two home runs, you went six up, six down. So I think you just need to settle in. That's all. Yeah, I was going to ask if it was like weird being in the dugout that early in the game, because that's probably something you never did before. Usually you're out there in the bullpen, right? So I mean, yeah, I, on day games, you know, again, I came up in Oakland. And so we have to go through the dugout to get to the bullpen. There's no like back way. And so on day games, I'm normally in there and the first, second inning before I make my way down. But it was weird. It was just a weird whole run up to the game because now I'm thinking about like, all right, what's what am I eating for breakfast? Is this going to be too heavy? You know, when do I pee? Like it was just a whole <laughs> like, you know, I don't know the routine and I didn't get much help um, from our PC at the time. He, he was like, I was like, dude, when should I go out there? And so I relied on on Ricky, Ricky Bones out there to help mm. me. He's like, slow down. He kept telling me like, sit down. You're you're going to be fine. And I was like, I can't. I got to go. It didn't help that you were facing the Dodgers, too. They really just kind of threw you into the fire, man. I mean, geez. I know. Like, and liter- yeah, that might be my, my, my kryptonite just in general. I never really had great success facing the Dodgers. Their lineup is crazy. And, and, but, oh, well. But thank you, Jack. Yeah, Jack, great question, man. I, this is something that even stumped me. I didn't remember this. It was a long day for me. I'm done by the second inning. I'm like, what do I do with myself now? <laughs> Did you hit the showers? You watched the whole thing? Like I went and did my, yeah, I went in and did, did my arm care and, and my conditioning and came back out and watched the game. The defense behind you was Dominic Smith in left field. You got Jose Bautista in right field. I always forget that he was a Met too, which is funny. That was our 2018 in a nutshell. I don't, I don't hear you talk about 2018 <laughs> too much. And I think I know why it's not, it's yeah. There's a, there's a whole lot that I didn't enjoy about that season. We'll dive into it one day, but today is not that day. Maybe, but thanks, Jack. <laughs> what do we got? Let's move on. I'm over that one. He's done. He's over 2019. <laughs> All right, let's see. This is this one's a good one. Here we go. 
Uh, yeah, hey, hey guys, so, uh, I just wanted to know, like, with the outfield seemingly being full, do the Mets still have a shot to get maybe a Seiya Suzuki or someone else? Thanks. Another no name. Some guys just like pretending their identity. I'll <laughs> I'll let you answer this one, I, like, first, so I'll let you go. All right, cool. Yeah, so I did a pretty deep dive into Seiya Suzuki back before the lockout initiated um, because he had a lot of suitors, obviously, and there was a lot of, like, mystique around him. Uh, I think an important thing to note is that uh, we had a couple uh, imports from the Nippon Baseball League in Japan, like Yoshi Sutsugo and Shogo Akiyama in the recent years. Akiyama went to the Reds. Uh, Sutsugo is starting to find his footing a little bit. He had a really good end to the year with the Pirates. Akiyama still didn't really figure things out, but they both had similar skill sets to say a Suzuki, but Suzuki has kind of been an echelon above them for pretty much the last six years. He's been a part of the best nine, which is basically the all Japan team for like five years in a row, won a bunch of gold gloves. He plays all three outfield positions. There is a lot to like about Sei Suzuki. He also has some of that 20, 20, 30, 30 power and speed. So it's easy to understand why he has a lot of suitors. That being said, him not signing before the lockout, I do feel like kind of hurts him a little bit just because a lot of position players went and got their contracts done before December 1st. Um, He's still promoting himself. He did a a show recently with Koji Urihara, who is the former closer for the Red Sox, and they sort of just talked about his potential landing spots, how he's feeling about the signing process and stuff like that. So I do think Sei Suzuki will land somewhere. I do think he will sign and play in MLB. I don't think it's going to be for the Mets, though, because I think the Mets knew they couldn't get him before the lockout. I'm sure they, they were in on him and had taken some calls, and they sort of went the safer route and got a guy I like in Mark Canna, who took for less money, less years. It makes a lot of sense there. Suzuki, you're really banking on the upside here. We haven't seen a lot of Japanese imports uh, success in, re- uh, in recent years, especially position players. It's more p- uh, pitchers that translate well. Uh, to MLB. So I think Suzuki ends up with maybe an AL East team like the Red Sox, maybe even the Yankees, who are sort of trying to fill that center field hole. I don't think that the Mets will sign him just because if they do, one of your outfielders goes to the bench in that way out of Nemo, Marte, or Canna. And you can plan for injuries, but you shouldn't overstuff your outfield if you don't have to. I agree. I don't think, first of all, Suzuki, I think, I hope he comes to Major League Baseball because I think he'll have success and I think it's a good good for the game to have another Japanese position player come over and be successful because I think that invites the best from there to come here if they want to. Um, And it entices teams to spread the game. I love that. Uh, Fans in Germany, fans in Japan, you know, it's beautiful. As far as the Mets signing a big name like that, I don't see it happening. I would love for it to happen. I think we, we still have a big bat uh, to fill uh, to replace in Michael Conforto. Um, I would love for it to be a left-handed hitter, but I don't think that there is a fit and I don't see them doing it from the outfield. So I think to answer Anonymous's question directly, I don't think we go out and make any more splashes for our outfield in free agency. Right. Yeah, I think that's probably the case. I think the Mets might have been in on him before Canna, like I said before. I do think you might see the Mets maybe go grab a fourth outfielder, like maybe a Jock Peterson, a powerful left-handed bat off the bench or something like that. But I don't think they're going to sign a starting caliber player to sort of just ride the bench, especially if it's Suzuki, who's probably going to get somewhere uh, in like a four-year deal, maybe worth $50 million. A team is going to spend big to sort of bank on him for the next few years. So I'd say expect Suzuki to go to the East or maybe even the Giants if the Giants are out on Conforto, maybe the Mariners as well. They've signed a lot of Japanese players. But I do think he will be a step above the guys that have recently come over, like Yoshi Satsugo and Shoko Akiyama. And that's why he's sort of, you know, demanding a, a higher price. And we'll probably get one too. So that's a good question from another known name. I'm intrigued by him as a player. And I'd love to see him, how he kind of transitions over to MLB. It'd be great. So so we got two left for today. I like this next one, too. I think this one is a good question for you, being a left-handed reliever. Oh, wonderful. Hi, this is Alex. I am obviously a Mets fan. Um, I Mostly, I think the most important thing is we need to go get Andrew Chafin, the left-handed reliever from the Athletics and Cubs. He had a really good year. He replaces Luke, and we need him. Um, I don't think we should sign Chris Bryant. I don't see any reason when we have Brett Beatty, when we have, you know, all these prospects, and Eduardo Escobar who can play third. doesn't make any sense. And, you know, anybody who says that, I still don't understand. Uh, 
Mets fans, you need to understand we're not going to get Carlos Rodon. Just accept it. Stop, you know, stop making tweets. Stop making Chill out. And uh, Schwarber's definitely a good option if the if it comes, if the DH comes. But I think besides that, I think we're nearly done. Just need to get Andrew Chafin. Uh, thanks. All right, so let's take this step by step because he, he outlines a lot here. I know we talked about Bryant last time, so we can kind of gloss over that a little bit. But I do like Was that Alex, first of all. Alex, yeah, that's his name. Thank you for the question, Alex. Thank Appreciate you for it. The question. Appreciate it, man. I do like the Andrew Chafin idea, though, and that's why I kind of wanted to pass the baton to you, being that he's an Oakland A and a left handed reliever, sort of a veteran, too. He has a lot of years now. Yeah, I think he's 31, maybe 32, going into his age 32. He is 31. Yep. Yeah, so I like I like Chafin as a as a pitcher. I think he's the more traditional. Um, I think he does better against lefties than he does righties, even though he's good against both, which I think is super important. I really think he's coming into his own the last couple of years. Um, he's he's a great pitcher. I don't think we need him though. I do think we should go for him, but if we don't get him, I don't think our our season's ruined because. There's another guy over there that came from Oakland and Jake Diekman that I think is really good as well. He doesn't have those normal lefty righty splits, but again, you just want to switch it up. And he comes from that crossbody lefty, bringing some heat, throws mid to upper 90s consistently. Um, I like both of those guys, but uh, obviously Chafin's number one. I just don't, I don't, I don't want to give him a four year deal if that's what's out there. You know what was what was Loop's deal? Uh, Loop deal was for uh, two years with a third year option on the team, and he's getting around eight point five million dollars a year. So he won't command that kind of deal, but Chafin will probably get two years. Yeah, so a two year deal would be I would be OK with a two year deal for him. Uh, two year seven, whatever the case may be. I, I like it. Uh, if that's what you can get him for, I think he would make our team, you know, like Alex said, I think it would com- kind of complete it. Uh, but I don't think if we don't get Chafin it doesn't it's not over you know I think loop was more that fit if we can bring back loop I felt like it would have been a better push but uh if Chafin's the guy then so be it if not we can fill him with Diekman there's there's places that where we can fill the back end of the bullpen from the left side um besides him but I agree that he's a good target yeah I definitely love the Jake Diekman idea he's another guy that I kind of forgot about and you look at the Mets bullpen and they've designed it pretty well but the one thing they are missing is that power punch left-handed reliever uh so there are a couple routes you can go I do think Chafin is the best option after loop he's coming off a year where he pitched in 71 games with a 1.83 ERA even after getting traded mid-season um and I think I think a big thing you mentioned before that's important is he can pitch to both lefties and righties you have to think about this three batter rule that's probably here to stay in MLB. You can't have the situation a lefty anymore. You need guys that are going to be able to get both. Chafin's a ground ball guy, and you have great infield defense behind him, so that's a plus. And, you know, the Mets have deep pockets. We all know that, so I think they're willing to spend a little big on a reliever. I don't think they were ever going to spend $20 million on loop, though. I don't think that was ever in the cards. And I don't think that Chafin will repeat a 1.83, but if you get him in his solid career numbers, like a 3.51 from 2017, I think that's all you can really ask for, because you're not asking for Chafin to be a closer. You're asking for him to fulfill a role that you need filled. So I think him or Deekman would be solid options out of Oakland. And I like that question. How did Chase and Shreve do last year? Because I liked what how he looked for us in the 2020 season. Obviously, I think his numbers were a little inflated um, due to the shortened season, but I liked him as a pitcher. I thought his he had like this, this split change, I think, that he was throwing that was effective versus both. Uh, and he's as he gets older and gains more experience, I, I just like. I liked how he looked in uh, a uniform and and kind of the approach that he brought. Uh, he had a, he had a great year last year. Yeah, and the Mets just kind of let him walk too for league minimum. They didn't pick him up after 2020 when he was solid, and he got even better with the Pirates. I didn't even notice that really. 57 games. That's pretty good. 57 games. He had 56 in a third inning, so he's almost one full inning. Uh, uh, in appearance, which is exactly what we talked about, about the, the traditional loogie being gone. And he had a, a three, two. Um, that's wonderful. He only gave up. How many hits did he give up? 
43 hits and 56 innings. Not bad, man. I wonder what his splits were, but we can, that's what I mean. There's options out there. It's a very thin market, but you can go out and bring Chase and Shreve back who showed that he can pitch in New York. I know it was a 2020 season, but he was a Yankee as well. Right. Uh, and had some success. Um, I like guys like that. You don't need to, to overpay, which is why I think they let loop go. Yeah. Um, for a guy that had coming off like his career year. Um, so there, there's options there. The one other scary option that I think the Mets are definitely going to consider, uh, is, Bra- <laughs> is Brad hand. Uh, please, who, don't. please don't. He's here, man. I think they got him. They brought him back. And I think they, they saw some things that they liked. They talked a little bit about it towards the end of the season. And if they do miss out on Deakman and Chafman, if the market is there for those guys, I definitely think that Brad hand will be our lefty reliever going into the year. Hopefully he can bounce back. Um, but yeah, it's, it's looking like it's Shreve Deakman. Well, either way, I, I'll, I'll address Brad Hand. I mean, he could ab- absolutely have a bounce back. Uh, he had a rough go of it in 2021. That was a that's a fact. But he had a really good 2020. He had good 19, great 18. Like he's he's it was just so bad for us down the stretch. Like every time he came in, it was like a rough watch. And so that's that's a sticky thing for me. Maybe it's a I don't know if he's got to get. Does he get a guaranteed deal? I don't know. I think he's the uh, the backup to the backup. Yeah, I don't know. So that's 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 an interesting question. But I do I like Chase and Shreve. If we get Chafin's the target, you know, I think that's it. Then Deekman right behind him. Those guys will be guaranteed deals somewhere. Uh, and then outside of that, you got Hand and and Shreve. All right, and we got one more here from Joe, and he lives in Maine, and I love Maine. So shout outs to Joe. Never been. Need to go. <gasps> Gotta go. It's beautiful. Hey, what's going on, guys? Joe here, lifetime Mets fan, lifelong Mets fan, but I grew up in Maine, so never really had any Mets fans around me. It was all online and through podcasts like this, so big fan. Uh, my question is about what you think Showalter and the Mets should do with Robinson Cano. He's making a ton of money, but there are definitely – a lot of other players who I'd like to see play over him, and he's gotten popped for PED usage a couple of times. So interested to hear your thoughts about what the Mets should do with him in the lineup and also how Showalter and the new coaching staff should treat him in the clubhouse as like a veteran, but also someone who's done some things that they don't want younger guys to do. So keep, the, keep up the great work. Love the show. LFGM. LFGM, baby. I'll let you go first. I, I, I have some things, and, and as a former player, I feel a certain way about some things. So I'll let you, from from being a Mets fan, uh, go first. Thank you, Joe, from Maine, by the way. First off, thank you, Joe, for a great question there. It's it's a tough situation. Uh, for those who don't know, Cano is playing baseball right now uh, in the Winter Dominican League. He's hitting pretty well. As we talked a little bit before about his power numbers a little bit going down. But outside of all of what Cano might bring to the table as a player, you do have to think about him as a personality in the clubhouse. We mentioned the two PEDs uh, getting popped for. There's a lot of money tied into Cano. But there also is a factor in that there are guys in that clubhouse that do look to him as a leader, and he does have a connection with those guys. I think the first thing I should say here is that Cano is going to be a Met in 2022. I don't think there's any possibility that the Mets just eat the money and let him go or find a trade suitor. I don't think that's going to happen. So what what you look for now is Cano possibly producing as a veteran bench guy. And there is a possibility for that. But I think that his his weight in the clubhouse will probably guarantee his stay in 2022. Uh, and I think, you know, if he can positively influence guys like Francisco Lindor, like Jeff McNeil and others, then I, I'm, I'm personally okay with it. I don't think that he should be, you know, your starting second baseman batting fifth on opening day. Um, but if he can be a solid bench bat and contribute in more layers than just that, I have no problem with him being here. He can play multiple positions. He's a proven veteran. He's got playoff experience. And, you know, there's no way around him. So you might as well just hope for the best and hope that you can get the best out of him. Uh, I'm torn. You know, we talk about Robinson Cano and he's got the the second time getting popped for PEDs, missed all of last year. Um, and he will be back. He'll be a bat off the bench, a left-handed bat that the team needs. They're already paying him $20 million. So they're going to see what they've got in him, and they should. But I'm torn. Like uh, the way Mets fans feel about Cano, the way I feel about it, I, I've been torn with te- other teammates that have taken PEDs. I enjoyed playing with Bartolo, but Bartolo got pop two on the team that I was playing for in 2012 with the A's. And then 
you know, that was a big letdown. We lost some mid season. We were making a run. It was a uh, emotional. And for a guy that played my whole career clean to have a guy that I, I look up to cheat, it was tough. And then seeing him again in, in another uniform at an advanced age, it's always a question of like, are you cheating again? Or how do I feel about you? It's, it's, it's a mix of emotions for me because I, I feel like maybe these guys are taking away from a guy working his way clean and, and taking a spot on the bench as a cheater from a guy who is trying to, to make the big leagues, a young guy. Maybe a Khalil Lee might be that bad off the bench, get his feet wet, whatever the case may be. So I am torn. I think personally, as a Mets fan, I would want him to address the media, address the fans, get say something, make yourself available for one, you know, at least one, let's have it out. Let's have like a sit down, talk about what it is that went through your head, what it was, confess, whatever the case may be. There's unaired laundry that needs to come out for me to be on board and root for you as a player, as a person. Um, I think he needs to, there's something needs to be said. Uh, I've heard nothing but nice things about him in the clubhouse uh, on how he can help people. It's the same way with Nelson Cruz. You know, we talk about signing him. Nelson Cruz got popped, you know, against playing with the Texas Rangers against my A's. And so I had a, but I've heard great things about who he is as a person, his hard work, what he does for the young Latin players coming up and how they've, he helps mold them into a better person. So I'm all for serving your time and coming back and rehabbing. But I think a second time is hard pill for me to swallow. Um, you know, and so I think he needs to come out and kind of, he's been a quiet player, a quiet pro for a long time. And I respect that. But after this second time, I think you need to, to make yourself available and accountable uh, and you'll be able to, to, to gain respect or even if it's to tell people, I don't care, I'll be the villain, you know, middle fingers to you, kind of do it. You need to do something, thumbs down. No, no, no. Like, I think he needs to like either say I'm, I'm open. I, the, he deserves to be held accountable. I think that as a pro, the second time, first time, benefit of the doubt, whatever the case may be, you know tainted supplements or what, you know, tainted meat, whatever the case is. Second time you're going to sit there and you're going to, you're going to wear some tough questions. So um, that being said, he is a, he is a left-handed bat that you need. And if he's, if he's effective as a player, I think he's, he could push off the bench. I think he deserves to start off the bench and, and have some at bats from there. And if he works his way, if somebody's struggling, if McNeil doesn't wind up being the player that we think he is, that I personally think he is, he could slot into that starting role of a VR style injury comes and he takes over. But I feel a few types away about it, mixed emotions. So I'm going to stop rambling. Uh, First of all, not rambling. I thought that was a pretty concise reply, Thank especially you. coming from a player. The uh, The other thing I wanted to bring up is something that we said on the very first episode of Shea Station ever. I don't know if you remember, but it was right after uh, the Mets got swept in Philadelphia. Things were bad, and Pete Alonso told the fans to just smile. You get to watch baseball. And our response to that was, do not treat New York fans like they're stupid. And I'm going to give the same advice to Robinson Cano. Uh, we all know what he did. We all know about his track record and all of the uh, the quiet personality he's taken on throughout his career. But you can't stay silent, especially after a second time. People want answers. People want clarification as to why your role will still be fulfilled on the Mets in 2022. And if he remains silent, then that's just a, a bad look on him. It's hard to get fans behind you outside of on-field performance in that case. Uh, another thing I want to say is that uh, you mentioned a great point about a youngster maybe not getting his chance with Cano in, his, in the way. And I definitely agree. You have Mark Vientos, who was tearing the cover off the ball in AAA. And this off-the-bench spot as a hitter likely would have been his if Cano wasn't tied up in money. The same thing goes for Jonathan Villar, who might want to come back to the Mets. Now his role is sort of taken up as the left-handed middle infield guy. So 
on one on one hand, Cano could fill in for a struggling guy and maybe produce in that way. But on the other hand, a spot is being taken up by a guy with a messy track record and not a lot of fond memories as a Met. So I think the most important thing to do is exactly what you said. Just address the media. Get out in front of it before rumors begin swirling again or people begin talking again about it because it will come back into the media spotlight as soon as we start seeing him in spring training. It's just a fact of the matter. If, if, if he doesn't address the media, if he doesn't allow himself to be held accountable to the fan base and, and be open for at least one press conference and, and be asked some hard questions and answer them honestly, it'll be hard. I won't be able to root for him. But if he holds himself accountable, I'll still have these like you cheated twice at least. Um, I'll have this doubt in my head, but I could at least root for him because he plays on a team that I care about. You know what I mean? And, and he's had a wonderful career. He's probably a super nice guy, but if you don't stand and at the, at your locker after a a time when you give up a home run, this is a, this is a, this is a have it out. If the fans deserve you to take your public lashings. And if you're not willing to do that, it's your right, your right as a player, whatever the case may be, if you don't want to do that, then I can't really root for you. Um, Give yourself a chance. So it'll be interesting to see the approach that he takes. Um, I, I don't know what he's going to do. He, he, it'll be interesting. I, I want to know like if, if Joe from Maine, how you feel personally, what you think you need to do, because, because I'm all, I'm mixed in emotions because this was my job for a long time. I, I remember getting, option down when a guy I know is cheating I didn't I found out later that he was cheating got popped in that same uh that same time as Bartolo you know cost me super two you know what I mean I it cost me arbitration and it I got angry this could be happening so I, I'm curious as to what some fans and that's why I want Cano to be hold himself accountable to stand in front of a press conference and allow himself to be given the questions that that the fan base deserves so yeah and i think you know as a former player you're completely right to be impassioned by an issue like this i think it it, it sort of gets it's not as taken seriously now because guys get popped less and like the steroid era of baseball has come and gone and you really only think of it in like you know those big brooding hitters that broke all the home run records but at the end of the day guys that do what cano did are potentially messing up the lives of other players. And you have to think about that from a human aspect, not just an on-field product aspect. Of course, I'm going to be happy if Cano has a great year because that helps my favorite team. But at the end of the day, I don't know what could have been for other guys had Cano not done what he did. But that's something that we'll all never know. So I do hope that Cano can hold himself accountable and really come across as the mature veteran that he should be at this point, you know, pushing 40 and still playing major league baseball. If you want to be a guy that people look up to and uh, still be perceived as a role model after these mistakes, because one mistake doesn't have to define you. Neither does two because Cano did it twice, but still you can hold yourself accountable and sort of make amends with something that you did. It's not impossible. I agree. I mean, just don't pretend it didn't happen. Just please don't do that. that that's the only thing. Don't, don't, not address it so that's that's my approach and that's that might be i love that question because that that gets to the root of of fandom and what it means and and being a player a former player there's so many things that go into that um you know as a as a former ambassador you know a big rep for the union i was always torn with you know because the union has to defend all of its players you know all of these changes that were made to the testing process, 99% of it were player pushed, more testing, deeper testing. We were all for, you know, at least my generation of player. And I'm sure the guys wish that they had it back in the, the steroid era because the, there was a lot of guys that were given this option of like, these guys are all cheating. What do I do? You're put into that, that, you know, I would love to say right now wholeheartedly, that during the steroid era, I would love to say that I wouldn't have taken steroids because that's an easy way to say you wouldn't, but I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't put in that opportunity. I know that I didn't take them as during my era and it's, there's less excuse now. And so 
you know, I, it's just a, it's a full, it's a full spectrum of, of how I feel. And there's, there's a lot of factors and I'm very empathetic as a human being in general. And so I could put myself in somebody's shoes from the Dominican Republic, who's, you know, maybe changes an entire generation, multiple generations of a, a family. But again, you gotta, you gotta hold yourself accountable and, and answer these questions. Otherwise it's, you're an easy guy to root against. Yeah, definitely agree. Well, speaking of answering questions, Joe, that was an excellent question to end our show. And to everyone else that called in and gave us great discussion today, we want to thank you. We will be doing more of these in the future. So if you missed the chance, make sure you go follow Shea Station on Twitter and Instagram and keep an eye out for the voicemail number that drops next time because we would love to hear from you. And make sure you give us your name so we can thank you properly. But Jerry, what would you think yeah, of our yeah, next time? I, yeah, man, I loved it. I, I enjoyed it very much. It's good to hear from from the people that listen. It's good to hear questions uh, from a fan base about uh, something that we're passionate about. So I, I loved it. I'm excited for the next time we do things. Uh, and again, leave your name so you can get a shout out. Or or like uh, Jack, what was his Twitter and Instagram? Do you remember? Uh, MLB, MLB Nerds. MLB Nerds. Everybody's favorite, apparently. apparently. Um, so yeah, we'll give you a plug. Absolutely. All right. I think that's all we got for today. You got anything else, Joe? I don't. Thank you. I, I, I really enjoyed talking about it. Now I'm all fired up and, and ready to go. It was a good go. response, man. I loved it. Emotional. Yeah, man. I love baseball. I care about it. I care about it at its core. I care about the future of the game. Integrity, like all that stuff. I love baseball. I was a fan. I will always be a fan before I was able to play the game. And I care about it. And I think it's important and if you don't address it, then you don't, you're like, it's tough. It's tough for me. So we'll see. All right, guys. Well, that's our episode of Shea Station. I'm Jolly Olive. And I'm Jerry Blevins. Thank you. Awesome mailbag. I'm looking forward to the next thing uh, next time. Thank you, guys. Let's go Mets. Let's go Mets.